Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show, and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a sticker podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. We were in the car together in the limousine headed to uh, meet the body at the airport. Mm. So I heard what he said because the phone was on speaker. What did he say? Well, basically he said, um, well, I guess he knew what he signed up for, but I guess it still hurts. Hmm. That's what he said. The president said to her, um, he knew what he signed he knew, up for. He knew what he was signing up for. But when it happens, it hurts anyway. Uh huh. Yeah. So it's almost as if this is a young, young woman who has two children who is six months pregnant with a third child. Jesus. She has just lost her husband. She was just told that he cannot have an open casket funeral, which gives her all kinds of nightmares, how his body must look, how his face must look. Mm -hmm. And this is what the President of the United States says to her? Yeah. First it was the NFL, and now it's Gold Star Families, and it's, uh, you know, his chief of staff, John Kelly. Won't you ask John Kelly if Obama called all the family? I called all the family. I do, I do a combi. I do a combi. I call, and I send a letter. I call, and I... You know what? Uh, everybody now in the media is looking for Gold Star Families to talk to, and they're looking for Gold Star Families to find out whether or not Trump called them, because, you know, here's the thing. You have to remember that during the Bush years, when we were at the height of the Iraq war and the war in Afghanistan and even during the Obama administration, we lost. I don't know if you even pay attention anymore. We lost six thousand nine hundred people uh, in these battles over these last uh, 16 years. And uh, during the Trump administration, uh, maybe 25. This is the count that I have. 25 have passed, uh, you know, passed. They were killed. 25 were killed. Uh, and Trump apparently thinks he has called or sent a letter to or done a combi because he likes the combis, called them all. Uh, and, and, and quite frankly, uh, no, that's not true. I found four families that he didn't call. I found four families that he didn't uh, send anything to. And I just uh, the Washington Post just found a dad named Chris Baldridge uh, who, uh, you know, was. Uh, he's from Zebulon, North Carolina. He's the father of a corporal, an army corporal, Dylan Bald Baldridge, 22-year-old kid. Um, and uh, him and two fellow soldiers were gunned down in Afghanistan by a police officer. It was an inside attack. His father, you know, uh, uh, did get a call from Donald Trump. And he says in that phone call, Donald Trump offered to pay him $25,000 out of his own personal pocket uh, because, you know, there is a death benefit when you die and it's $100,000. And this father was saying, well, my ex-wife is getting it and I don't have two nickels to rub together. So, you know, she's going to get the hundred grand. I got I get nothing. And he said Trump offered $25,000 and then sent a letter to this father. And the father said he opened up the envelope and there was, you know, like a note, but there was no check. And he was like, where's the check? And he wanted to learn how to tweet so he could tweet out that Trump is a liar. I mean, th these stories are going to come from everywhere now, from everywhere. But, of course, this is the saddest one because the president never would have called these four families except for the fact that he was asked a question in this impromptu rose garden thing that he threw together the other day and uh, someone asked him when are you going to talk about what happened in niger when are you going to talk about these uh the, the soldiers that were killed there i mean we're in the we're in the media we don't even know what happened we're trying to figure out what happened best we can do is you know figure out that there was no help for them nobody came for them uh the french flew their mirage fighter uh, planes in there from like 200 
275 miles away uh, in, in, in Bur- you know, uh, Bur- Bur- Burka Faso or, you know, some place the French like to colonize in Africa, which is, you know, really Africa's entire problem is colonization. We could have that conversation one day. It's just hideous. Uh, Puerto Rico was colonized, too. And look at them. A million people still don't have water. And this is another thing he said at that press conference. Oh, you know, we send water. It's their fault. They don't know how to distribute it. Really? American citizens just don't know how to uh, distribute water. I mean, this is just, he's so bogus. He's so bad. He's such a bad, bad man. Uh, But okay, stick to this story, Randy, because there's so many of them today. But all right, so here you have, uh, this is a local story for me. Okay, this is a local story for us here in Florida because this kid, LaDavid Johnson, is from here. He's from Miami Gardens. He's from right down the road. And uh, the congresswoman who was riding in the limousine with the family on their way to the airport to pick up and greet and meet the body of LaDavid Johnson, who's only 25 years old. He's 25 years old. He leaves behind a 24-year-old wife with two kids already. She's got a six-year-old, a two-year-old, and she's due uh, to deliver her third child in January. And the congresswoman from her district not only was in the car because it's her district and this was one of our heroes locally, but because she knew La David Johnson. She knew him from the time he was a kid. She knows the whole family. She is a real district congressman. She shows up in the district. She actually does work in the district. She started a mentoring program in the district. And La David Johnson was part of her mentoring program. And she knows the whole family. She knows La David. She knows his brother, who's now at the same college Jessica went to. She, the, the brother is at FAU. That's where Jessica went, Florida Atlantic. And he's an engineering student there. So, I mean, and, the, and, and of course, the president can't stand the truth. And anytime somebody tells the truth about something heinous that he does or something insensitive or something crazy or something, you know, uh, bizarre that he does, then that person, of course, has to be called a liar or the news reporting has to be called fake or, uh, you know, the, the person delivering the message is suddenly the bad person instead of the person who did the thing that was completely wrong, which is him. He just blames the messenger over and over and over and over. And so do his supporters, because on my page, you know, yesterday, I, uh, I did a little, you know, segment on what happened to these guys. And that's what the question was. The question was not whether or not you called the families. The question was what happened to our soldiers in Niger? You know, it's been two weeks. You haven't said a word about them. What happened to them? And one guy was left behind, happened to be Le David Johnson, who was the guy that was left behind. He was left behind in a remote part of the desert, out there rotting in the sun for two days. I don't know what condition uh, he's in, but it can't be good because he can't have an open coffin funeral. But anyway, here here is uh, uh, the representative for Frederica Wilson uh, from the district who knows this family. Sergeant Johnson was wonderful. He was smart. He was athletic. He's married to the most wonderful woman who has two children, and she is with a child. They are devastated. He was raised by his lovely aunt, an uncle. Oh, I can relate. He has two younger brothers, and they all came through the 5,000 Role Models of Excellence Project. <laughs> One of them is in college at Florida International University studying engineering. The other one is in the 5,000 Role Models of Excellence Fire College. Mm. He's going to be a firefighter. Mm. And we have started a scholarship fund for his children, for his two that are living and for the one yet born she knows this family she knows the wife she knows uh la david she knows la david's brothers she knows uh the aunt you know i can relate i'm an aunt that raised my sister's child too i mean she knows the whole family she knows kawanda jones johnson who raised these uh these children one's going to be a firefighter the other one went into the military he he became a green beret for god's sake the other one is an engineering student these are wonderful kids and the president called them all liars called them all liars 
Frederica Wilson was in the car. Other people uh, heard the, the conversation. Uh, there were the whole family was in the limousine going to the airport with this congresswoman to uh, meet the body. And uh, they put the president on speakerphone so the whole family could hear what the president had to say uh, to them in their time of grief. They wanted to share the president of the United States with the whole family. There's no reason for the president to be so insensitive, not only to the family of this soldier, but the impervious rhetoric is, you know, it's disrespectful to the family of every soldier that has paid the ultimate price for our freedom. And our community is livid because this was our hero. We don't have many heroes in our young men in Miami-Dade County, but he was a hero for us. And we don't like what was said. And that is not something that you say to a grieving wife. What was your reaction, Representative? I asked them to give me the phone mm. because I wanted to speak with him. And I was going to curse him out. <laughs> that was my reaction at that time. I was livid. But they would not give me the phone. What did she say? She, just was, she was just crying. She couldn't say anything. The only thing she said when it was time to hang up was, thank you. Goodbye. Oh, my God. She was crying the whole time, and when she hung up the phone, she looked at me and said, he didn't even remember his name. Oh, my that's God. The, that's the hurting part. And, and so I think what's made some headlines is that the, the line that you recounted from the president saying that uh, Sergeant Johnson knew what he was getting into when he signed up. What was the tone and the tenor from the president in those particular comments? He was almost like joking. He said, well, I guess you knew he some, something to the fact that he knew what he was getting into when he signed up. But I guess it hurts anyway. You know, just matter of factly um, that this is what happens. Anyone who is signing up for military duty is signing up to die. And uh, that's the way we interpreted it. Yeah. And it was horrible. It was insensitive. It was absolutely crazy and unnecessary. Was, I was livid. Was that Sergeant Johnson's widow's read of the call also? Was she upset by it or are you speaking for yourself? She was in tears. She was in tears. And she said he didn't even remember his name. Wow. And then Trump tweeted, quote, Democratic Congresswoman totally fabricated what I said to the wife of a soldier who died in action, and I have proof. Sad. I'm sure his proof is like right next to the tapes that he made of James Comey begging for his job. Remember that? Yeah. You know, in, in Trump's mind, if he says, I have proof, that is proof. And everyone else is lying. He is calling everyone a liar. He's calling this grieving widow a liar. He's calling the aunt who was in the car. Also, the mother, uh, the um, the aunt of, uh, you know, that raised uh, uh, LaDavid Johnson. She, she, her name's Kawanda Jones Johnson. She also said, President Trump did disrespect my son and daughter and also me and my husband. So who are we going to believe? The family of a soldier who died or the guy who's now threatening an 81-year-old prisoner of war that has cancer? You know, John McCain. Who do you want to believe? For a commercial-free, on-demand, whenever, wherever listening experience, visit randyrhodes.com for your personal premium podcast today. Yeah, you could buy tile at a chain store if you wanted to. You could wait for a kid to try and answer your questions about what's this made of or how do I install it or what's in stock. But what if you wanted serious craftsmanship? What if you wanted custom design, handmade, 
to order from your imagination or an inspiration photo that you love. Probably you think you can't anymore, but I did. When it was time to shop tile, I came across a family-owned business that still handcrafts each and every individual tile, matching your colors, your inspiration, your design. Tempest Tile Works. They're based in Portland, Oregon, and they still handcraft the most magnificent tile. Let them match to your fabrics or to your countertops or to anything you can envision for your bath or kitchen. Teeny tiny tiles to oversize their art or yours. It's all doable, it's all affordable, and it's all individually made just for your project. Visit Tempest Tile Works and look at their amazing gallery of designs and styles and give up the chain stores. Tempest Tile Works, custom made. TempestTileWorks.com. Tales of American Political History with Clinton Porter Hackney. We've been discussing the many protests in American history and the First Amendment's right of free speech. Although most protests in this country slowly fade, there have been many effective uprisings along the way. In fact, the first successful protest occurred before our Constitution that established free speech was even adopted. So what is an effective or successful protest? Well, I suppose the answer is somewhat subjective. We know that protests don't just involve complaints. They usually also seek real change. Thus, it might be said that a protest that achieves the changes sought is a success. And that was the case when the original 13 colonies rose up to protest against the British Crown's oppressive trade and taxation policies. Perhaps it is best summarized by the old well-known slogan, No Taxation Without Representation. Join us again next time for the Olive Branch Petition. This is Clinton Porter Hackney at cphackney.com. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1945. That was the day that Paul Robeson received the Spingarn Medal from the NAACP. The award was given annually to the African American with the highest achievement. Robeson certainly fit that criteria. He was born in Princeton, New Jersey. He attended Rutgers University, where he was an athletic standout and valedictorian. He earned his law degree from Columbia. He was a successful singer, as well as stage and film actor. He was also an internationally recognized star, with singing engagements all around the world. Robeson strongly supported labor and working people. He was also an outspoken critic of U.S. colonialism. His stand for social justice made him a target of Senator Joe McCarthy during the hysteria of the Cold War Red Scare. Because of his alleged communist ties, in 1950, Robeson's passport was revoked. It took him eight years to get it reissued. During that time, he could not travel abroad to perform. The International Union of Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers invited Robeson to sing at their Canadian convention in 1952. Since he could not travel, he sang over the telephone. The union then organized a concert on the Washington State-Canadian border. Standing on a flatbed truck parked on the U.S. side of the border, Robeson gave a 45-minute performance to a crowd of 40,000. People. He started the concert by saying, quote, I stand here today under great stress because I dare, as do you, all of you, to fight for peace and for a decent life for all men, women, and children. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. What does he care if the world's got troubles? What does he care if the land ain't free? All things Randy at randyroads.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Do you think he will defend it and look the other way? I mean, he's saying it's disgusting, pointing at the media. Is it really possible that he believes that? and is not aware of the blatantly obvious fact, which is the President of the United States is the one who made this political in the first place. He's aware of it. He knows what he's dealing with. But he is the Chief of Staff for the President of the United States. And if he's not there, somebody else is going to be there. And I can assure you that we are in a very dangerous situation. If we get people like Steve Bannon, uh, the Sebastian the Gorka, the people who were removed from the White House, were extremely dangerous. And there are others lurking in the background uh, so, uh, who want the United States at war with the Muslim world. I a very dangerous situation. We need General Kelly right where he is, and that's where he best serves his country. 
Okay, so people are arguing. That's Richard Painter, obviously. Uh, uh, Richard Painter, who is the vice chairman of Crew, who is literally suing the president uh, in uh, court uh, and uh, uh, for the emoluments, for violating the emoluments clause of the Constitution. You know, Richard Painter was the ethics chairman for uh, President, uh, he was the ethics advisor to President George W. Bush, and then uh, he became a law professor at the University of Minnesota and vice chairman of Crew Citizens for Responsible Ethics in, uh, in, in, in Washington, which is, you know, these are oxymorons, but he tries. He really does try to uh, return ethics to uh, uh, the, 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 the commander in chief, at least in that, in that realm. But Richard Painter was on uh, with CNN last night. And of course, everybody was wondering, what will John Kelly do? What will he do? Because the president of the United States has called a congresswoman a liar and has directed the media to talk to John Kelly, who is like the, 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 the president's, uh, you know, uh, shield. OK, he's using the president is using. This is another reason why I believe the president has surrounded himself with generals. Because people don't like to argue with generals. Generals have a very specific view of the world. OK, a very specific view. It's very, very different from your view of the world. It's uh, it's 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 a different kind of uh, worldview. Um, and so and so General Kelly is being used as a sort of human shield for President Trump every time President Trump makes a mistake with the military, right? And so that's why he sent out General Kelly. So last night, uh, uh, Richard Painter was asked whether or not he thought that Kelly would, you know, fall on his sword. And he said, yeah, and he has to because General Kelly, General Mattis, even Rex Tillerson, apparently are viewed as the literal human shields between chaos and us. So I invited Richard Painter on because uh, I have a different view. Uh, hello, Richard. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. You're on one of the call lines, not on my hotline. I was very surprised to see you there. Hi. Hello. All right. So I, I want to uh, talk to you about the lawsuit yesterday, the argument that was heard in court uh, uh, regarding the emoluments clause. But before I do that, I saw you last night on CNN uh, predict exactly what just happened. Were you able to see John Kelly's uh, br uh, in the briefing room, John Kelly in the briefing room just a few minutes ago? No, I did not see that, uh, but I think that he uh, he knows he's got a job to do, which is to try as best he can to hold this White House together. Uh, they are in a uh, very difficult situation uh, with the president behaving irrationally, and there are still some extremists who want to push this president toward uh, confrontations with the Muslim world, toward extreme nationalism. And other very dangerous plans. So uh, I think it's important uh, that General Kelly stay on top of the situation. Stay so, there in the White House. So your back. your view is that General Kelly needs to be a good soldier uh, the whole way through this mission. That he needs to stay as the human shield between complete and other utter white supremacy, fascism, uh, you know, chaos, World War Three. That his service uh, in the White House is 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 so needed because without him there, we would end up with someone worse. Is that it? Well, very much so. I think we're at great risk uh, of the president uh, being uh, mentally unstable. I'm very concerned about his mental health. It's all for implications of the 25th Amendment with respect to the president. That's what I want to uh, talk to you about, because I have a, a... We are in a very precarious situation, and um, the one thing we know is uh, that General Kelly has restored some order to this White House, uh, in some sense of rationality. He's pushed out the most extreme, the most dangerous people um, in, in this White House. Um, and uh, Bannon and uh, uh, Gorka, some of them. Um, and uh, it's 
just a very, very challenging situation right now. So well, I it is interesting because la- the, the last time I talked to you, uh, we were you you were telling me that uh, you know uh, Bannon and Gorka have got to go, uh, and and that that is yep. the only uh, the only thing that you could that you were working on right then, and, and of course they did go, and I guess you're crediting uh, John Kelly's management style there in the White House for uh, you know sending Bannon back to his fake news website uh, where he is primarying uh, Republican senators, which is another conversation and Sebastian Gorka but you know what uh, my view is this you know uh, these are temporary solutions yes uh, John Kelly was being used as a human shield today I think when you see this uh, this press briefing you're gonna be sickened by the the amount of falling on the sword that was required and how John Kelly decided to trash this congresswoman who was a friend of uh, the wife of this fallen soldier and was a mentor to La David Johnson, the, the sergeant who died. But that being said, wouldn't it be quicker and swifter if Kelly and Mattis and, and Tillerson and the cabinet, a majority of the cabinet members just said what everybody knows, and that is that this president is unstable, he's unraveling, he's a loose cannon, he could cause World War Three, and invoke the twenty fifth Amendment? I mean you're you're Well, I think they may uh, I think they should, and I have called for that in a separate uh, um op ed with a clinical psychologist looked at what's going on in this uh, administration, what's going on in the White House, the way the president has been behaving. Uh, but uh, in order for them to do that, they need to be there. Uh, and if the rational people quit this administration one by one, if we lose Pellerson, we lose Kelly, we lose McMaster, we lose any one of them, I think we'd be in very serious trouble. Uh, so we need them to hold on and uh, try and uh, get rid of the more irrational people. Uh, we still have uh, 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 this uh, fellow Stephen Miller in the White House. He's quite dangerous. Um, and there's some others as well uh, who uh, you know, are close to the Bannon faction. Um, and then, yes, I, I do think that this president has shown that he is not capable of doing the job. He's not mentally capable of it. He's so what's the hold up? Erratic. Why fall on your sword? Why actually dredge up, you know, horrible feelings about your son and that the president made political? You know, why countenance a liar? Why continue down this bad road of politicizing the deaths of soldiers when the president is the one who actually did it just because he couldn't answer the question what happened in Niger? I mean, why, why stand by? Why go out? to the press briefing room today and and trash the congresswoman I, I i don't yeah well i don't know why general kelly did exactly that but at this point i mean my issue isn't the congresswoman or anything else we have the president who is mentally uh, unstable mm-hmm. he demonstrated that we got more tweets today talking about the fbi collaborating with a russian and the democrats i've never heard of someone accuse our own fbi collaborating with the russian yeah yet the president of the united states said that in a tweet today yeah he is not fit for office and so I don't know what General Kelly has to do, uh, but, you know, if he wants to trash a few congressmen or congresswomen between now and then, if he's going to do it, he's going to have to do it. I don't know. But they need to uh, do something about President Trump. He is not capable of holding this position, and he's the one in control of the nuclear code. I, I'm, I very, very I, I'm very concerned about it as well. I mean, I, there is not a day that goes by anymore where I'm not afraid that I'm going to wake up to nuclear winter or I'm going to wake up to sirens or I'm going to wake up to 10 million dead in South Korea. Do you know? I mean, I really am uh, scared and I've never been so terrified in my entire life uh, with this man. But uh, that being said, I, I really think that, you know, somebody obviously uh, W came out today. He gave a speech about white supremacy and the dangers that he sees. And it was it was an amazing speech that he gave. But, um, you know, everybody gets this. So if everybody gets it, what are we waiting for? Well, I don't know why they're waiting. I think that we need to get a majority, you have to have a majority of the cabinet. Yeah. Uh, and the vice president who's willing to pull the trigger on that. And uh, so you have the majority of the cabinet and the vice president willing to pull the trigger. Uh, and uh, on the 25th Amendment, it's not going to happen. Uh, and then it still isn't permanent that Congress is willing to back them up by a, a, a vote of Congress. So this is going to be a, a, a very uh, difficult process. I think they need to get started on it. But the, the worst thing we do is have Kelly quit uh, or have... Uh, uh, McMaster quit or Tillerson. I'm very worried about Tillerson quitting. The Secretary of State is the most senior uh, member of the cabinet. And if he quits, we're going to get someone else in there. Well, he it's scares me, likely. too. I mean, when, when he was on State of the Union this weekend and he said, you know, I'll, I'll keep doing diplomacy until the first bomb falls. Really? 
I mean, that is not the job of the Secretary of State to say stuff like that. So that was a little yeah. unnerving, I have to say. But let me switch. Well, he may very well know that we are in a very difficult situation right now. With I President do. Trump. That, uh, but again, we need him in there because what are our alternatives? Uh, and I, I think our alternatives are a lot more worrisome. We need someone who's going to stand up to Trump. Yeah, but he's he's you know just decimating the 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 entire uh, State Department. I mean, there's no one there's no one in there anymore because of their management style, and it's just well, it, I think that goes right back to Trump and the interference yeah. by the White House. So, yeah. so at the end of the day, what we the, the problem is these people may do what they need to do to keep their job. We need them in there, but they need to act together, and they need to act quickly. Uh, uh, with respect to this president, I don't. I think that the the, uh, the president is not fit to hold this job. All his nuclear weapons, the ability to destroy human civilization, he has shown he's unstable. As I say again, he tweeted today that the FBI collaborating with the Russians. Of all things. I mean, that is just something you don't shoot your mouth off out of uh, 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 unless you got something to back it up. And uh, it, it's crazy. Uh, well, so, he, he, um, he trashes everything. I mean, he trashed his own intelligence services. And, you know, yesterday when Sessions was testifying about are we prepared for 2018 in the Russian, he said, uh, probably not. Great answer. Great. You know, I felt uh, very secure about voting. But let me let me switch your hat. OK, uh, now you're going to put on your lawyer hat and your vice chair hat because uh, you're vice chair of crew. And you actually uh, are you know, uh, in court, and I know there were arguments uh, yesterday uh, with regard to the emoluments clause violations that uh, you're alleging in court that the president has violated. And I know the president's attorneys went to court to ask for the the case to be dismissed. Can you tell me what happened? Well, the judge is going to decide this, he said, within 60 uh, days or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, How do you feel it went? Well, I, I, I think it went well, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, we have the issue of whether crew, uh, our organization, has standing to frame the lawsuit. That's one issue. The second issue is the interpretation of the monument clause. Yes. Whether the president is taking money from foreign governments in violation of the Constitution. And this isn't just the hotel rooms we're talking about, uh, the ballrooms that the hotels that the foreign governments rent out. It's, it's also the finance structure of the Trump business empire. We need to find out where he's borrowing his money. Exactly. Where coming and, from you know, I've, I've, I heard some of the um, arguments coming from, you know, the Trump side. Uh, and they want to characterize emoluments as simply gifts. That is not what the Constitution says, is it? Well, it says gift or you may not take a gift from a foreign government or an emolument. Exactly. Um, without the consent of Congress. So an emolument, obviously, is something in it, uh, other than just a gift. or It would just be redundant. Uh, an emolument, according to... The dictionaries at the time, Johnson's Dictionary, Dr. Simon Johnson, 1755 Dictionary, was a profit or benefit. It's a profit or benefit from dealing with a foreign government. We, we just don't allow that um, without the consent of Congress. If he thinks he wants to take this, he, you know, these profits, dealings with foreign governments, he can go to Congress, go to a Republican-controlled Congress, and get permission. Um, but and, otherwise, he can't do it. Right. And so they're arguing this very narrow definition of uh, what exactly you pointed out would be redundant gifts and emoluments or emoluments. Right. Uh, so emoluments mean payments from foreign governments. And of course, back in the day when this country was being formed and the Constitution was being written, I think the founding fathers were very aware of foreign government interference in the, the United States because we weren't quite yet the United States. We were colonies trying to break away from a foreign government. Government. So I think they yeah, sort they of try to, yeah, they want to uh, use their financial power to do what they couldn't do to force of arms, which was to bribe our politicians. Exactly. Our leaders, uh, through various business deals. So the, the big European powers at the time, they were all doing it over there to other countries, uh, uh, France and Great Britain, and, mm-hmm. uh, Austria, Hungary, and then the Russia. Right. And uh, Russia was a big one. And they were doing a lot of that in Poland and everywhere else trying to bribe all the all the foreign princes to side with the Russians and sending spies all over the place. I mean, they've been at that game for hundreds of years. And and the bottom line is the founders didn't want to have any part of uh, any of those big European powers or anybody else uh, jacking us around um, in, in the uh, uh, election. And so what we have here... Uh, you it- know, or affecting our, our government and, and dealing and making deals with the United States government officials. 
Right. And so what we have here, it seems to be a president who represents the founding fathers' worst fears of foreign uh, government money uh, going straight into the pocket of the president of the United States. I mean, no one will lend to Donald Trump because Donald Trump doesn't pay anybody back. So... Uh, back in the day, you know, we had these bankers, uh, I guess it was a PBS, you know, uh, a special long ago about how the president and, and, and Wall Street uh, didn't get along because he reneged on so many of the loans that he took that Wall Street just simply said, the bank simply said, we're not going to lend to him anymore. This guy uh, doesn't pay his legal bills. He doesn't pay his bank notes. He doesn't pay uh, loans that he has. So, you know, where does he get his money? Well, that's what we want the judge to find out. Yes. Because it is a problem if under the Constitution, if it comes from foreign government or foreign sovereign wealth fund or a forereign government controlled bank. Right. And that, you know, whether it's Russian or anything else. Now, I think Bob Mueller may chase down what's going on with the Russians. Right. At least we hope so. But um, this is an important provision of the Constitution. It was designed to prevent foreign interference with American government. Uh, we've uh, ironically had a great deal of foreign interference in our government this year, in our election. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, this is a critically important time, of course, to enforce this uh, provision of the Constitution. Well, I just wanted to check uh, you know, check in with you because, uh, A, you were right yesterday when you said ahead of the game that John Kelly would fall on his sword uh, to protect this president because he has to be a good soldier because he is the only thing standing between us and chaos, although I would prefer the 25th Amendment. Yes, it's a long process. Yes, it's two-thirds of the House. Yes, it's two-thirds of the Senate. It's a big damn deal. Uh, but I love the Emoluments Clause case. That's another constitutional case, and uh, we'll know in 60 days whether or not you get to proceed. And, uh, you know, there's so much... And, and and then, of course, there's the Mueller investigation. There's the Senate Intel investigation. There's the House. The House is so lame, but there's the House, uh, you know, investigation. So uh, I'm following you. I'm with you. I saw your tweets. I've been retweeting right along with you to the I leave out uh, George Bush Sr. because I think he's, you know, um, struggling to just live his life day to day. But the four living presidents, I have been tweeting them, asking them to please come, please say something today. W did. Uh, Barack Obama will be out today uh, campaigning. So maybe we're having a little impact. I mean, at least, uh, you know, I, I'd like to feel I'm piggybacking on your effort. And I, I appreciate that you did that, that you reached out to them. So thank you very much for uh, everything well, you're trying you to do. So much. I, yeah, I, thank you. And look forward to talking to you again soon, Randy. Will sure. do. Thank you so All much, right. Richard. Great. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Richard Painter doing what he knows how to do. I mean, just think about everybody is trying to come at him from different ang- I mean, Rep- Richard Payne is a Republican. I, I, there are so many Republicans. All, you know, all these generals are, are, are Republicans, okay? I, I, you have all these people. You, you, Bob Corker is a Republican from freaking Tennessee, okay? You have uh, 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 people from all. John McCain is a Republican from Arizona. You have. Uh, Jeff Flake, another Republican from Arizona. All these people and all these ways that people are trying, trying to get rid of this president. I've never seen such an effort against any president. And yes, it's true. I was totally against George W. Bush's policies. I didn't believe in lowering taxes for the wealthy in a time of war. I didn't believe that, you know, that we should go to war in Iraq. I had no idea why we were going. There were so many things I, I literally protested, okay? But I never felt like this. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes Air Force. Air, Air, Air Force. RandyRhodes.com. Hey, I need to tell you something about Herky Jerky because over the past year, you've been asking me to ask Jason from Herky Jerky if they will ever produce a a turkey jerky. Well, I'm proud to tell you that he says absolutely yes. And not only does he have it now, it's absolutely spectacular. Let me start with the taste. It is extremely soft and slightly sweet, and it's bite-sized pieces that taste just like the homemade oven-roasted turkey that you have on Thanksgiving. It's made from turkeys raised without added hormones and just the right amount of salt, natural smoke flavoring, and spices that will make your taste buds go wild. 
and you asked for healthy. Well, Herky Jerky Turkey Jerky has no nitrates, preservatives, MSG, or artificial ingredients, absolutely zero fat, and packs a whopping 11 grams of protein per serving, and very low in cholesterol. Quite simply, I think this is one of the healthiest and best tasting high protein snacks you can get. Herky Jerky is so excited to announce the new Turkey Jerky that they're offering $5 off all packs for the entire month of October. Just use promo code TURKEY when checking out. And as always, they don't sell the little dinky bags that you get at the gas station. They're 14-ounce zip-sealed packs, and they're meant to last. Herky Jerky, making quality jerky and meat snacks for almost 25 years. Got to tell you, I believe this is as good as anything I've ever tasted and the best thing they've ever produced. Try some today, HerkyJerky.com. This is the Voice of the Resistance. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network. Dear fellow progressive, these are the times that try men's souls. It is not the first time our country has been in peril, and it won't be the last. It is, however, a unique threat from within, one the precise likes of which we have never seen before. It is our modern media mix that has enabled an incurious, unserious, pathological liar and textbook narcissist to accede to the highest office in the land. His is a world of make-believe, one that could only have been concocted by a student of reality TV. At least we know he studied something. The imagined slights, the trumped up, pun intended, feuds, the insulting nicknames, the Twitter diarrhea, it is all of a piece. Entertaining, funny even, in another context, but when you're busy blowing up the country's longest-running foreign relationships, devastating the environment, threatening trade wars, and embracing all the wrong actors, it's really hard to find the humor. At Progressive Voices, we take holding the powerful accountable is our most serious mission, and there is nothing more important to us today than making sure the PV audience is informed with unbiased information and that more and more people become part of our audience and therefore are better informed than they can be by relying solely on the mainstream media, which, in so many ways, has shrunk from its duty as the watchdog of democracy. It is our sincere hope that you will help us in this important mission at this most critical hour. Go to ProgressiveVoices.com and make your donation today. Please give whatever you can. Remember, we are a tax-exempt 501c3, meaning that your donations are fully tax-deductible. Thanks for supporting the Progressive Voices Network. Hi, it's Randy Rhodes. Listen to me on the PV live stream or on demand or both on the PV app. Just go to ProgressiveVoices.com or download the Progressive Voices app. I remember as a kid, the stereotypical things associated with girls were cooking, cleaning, fashion, interior design, anything to do with children, hair, makeup. But you know, as an adult, I realize that the top earners in all of these professions are men. How did this happen? Well, it's one of the conversations we're going to have on my new show called She Persisted. I'm your host, Melissa Carter, and as a media personality, a lesbian, a single mom, and a patient with a chronic disease, I can tell you, I certainly have some opinions, (laughs) and I know that you do too. So let's be part of each other's lives and talk these things out on She Persisted. It's at 8 a.m. on the East on the Progressive Voices Network and on demand on the Progressive Voices app. I would really love for you to be part of the show because I believe that together we can go from she persisted to she thrived. I hope you'll join me. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. General Kelly said he was stunned uh, that Representative Wilson made comments at a building dedication honoring slain FBI agents about her own actions in Congress, including lobbying former President Obama on legislation. As General Kelly pointed out, if you're able to make a sacred act like honoring American heroes all about yourself, you're an empty barrel. If you don't understand that reference, I'll put it a little more simply. As we say in the South, all hat, no cattle. Well, in fact, have you seen the speech? I have. And then you know that most of it was her effusively praising these FBI agents. And when she was talking about what she did in Congress, she was not talking about 
get the security of $20 million. She was talking about naming the building she for these FBI agents, about that. whom she then went on to effusively praise. She was and also, that was the bulk of the speech. She also mentioned that, and she also had quite a few comments that day that weren't part of that speech and weren't part of that video oh that were also witnessed by many people that were there. Uh, what General Kelly referenced yesterday. Well, tell us specifically because exactly what he said. To, there was a lot of grandstanding. He was stunned that she had taken that opportunity to make it about herself. Can um, he come out here and talk to us about this at some point? I think so he's that he addressed that facts, pretty right? thoroughly yesterday. No, no, he was wrong yesterday in talking about getting the money. The money was. If you want to go after General Kelly, that's up to you. But I think that that if you want to get into a debate with a four-star Marine right? General, that's I think that that's uh, something highly inappropriate. Uh, it's highly inappropriate to question, uh, you know, the human shield that is John Kelly, who is protecting a narcissist. And and I got to tell you, you remember, I promised you that we were going to find John Gartner, who is the psychologist, the Princeton educated psychologist, the assistant professor, former assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University, who uh, was part, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the author of uh, part of the author, one of the uh, 27 uh, psychiatrists uh, called. Uh, uh, who wrote this book that made it to the New York Times bestseller list called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump uh, and it started a, uh, a group called Duty to Warn uh, John Gartner. Uh, and we did find him and it couldn't come at a better time, truly, because I have told you that I have experienced borderline personality disorder narcissist, a narcissist like this. I, I, I've seen it from beginning to end, and it doesn't end well. This man ended up being hospitalized for his own, uh, for his own protection. But uh, duty to warn is a legal term. Duty to warn is a legal term that applies to psychiatrists and psychologists. And they have a legal obligation to warn if, this, if the person they're treating seems like they will hurt themselves or they will become violent to others. And that is why this group is called Duty to Warn. And uh, John Gartner is uh, joining us now. Well, uh, welcome to the show, John. Uh, uh, Thank you. You're welcome. I'm I'm excited to talk to you. I I, I heard I was reading the um, Sunday Times uh, book review, and I saw your book on the bestseller list, and I was like, oh my god. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, we said. Yeah, I mean, it was just it was so <laughs> it was so appropriate to what I've been thinking. Uh, except that you're yeah. you're a professional. This is what you do. You specialize in this right. uh, particular thing: borderline personality disorder, sadism, narcissism, and yeah. and 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 as I said, I, I've known somebody that suffered from this, um, and I know um, that they are contagious. Now, could you explain what I mean by that? <laughs> well. Uh, so he is a malignant narcissist, so he has all the symptoms of narcissistic personality, but he also meets full diagnostic criteria for paranoid personality disorder, all his crazy conspiracy theories, his demonization of the press, his demonization of minorities, his demonization of anyone who disagrees with him, like your clip uh, just a moment ago about the, you know, the congresswoman who exposed his sensitivity. Um, also antisocial personality disorder, so a complete comfort with lying, um, and exploiting and violating the rights of others, a lack of remorse or empathy for those people. Um, and as a result, and also sadism, uh, so that uh, we, they take pleasure in bullying and harming other people. Mm -hmm. And you put those traits together, and you have someone who is very malignant, and very destructive, and you're correct. It does not end well. And what I'm concerned about is that right now he is deteriorating. He is actually getting worse. And actually, uh, we predicted this because this is what malignant narcissists typically do when they do get power. Instead of pivoting and becoming more presidential, they actually become more extreme. They become more extreme in their grandiosity, more extreme in their paranoia, more extreme in their reckless, destructive behavior. Combined with that, I think he's having some organic brain deterioration. His vocabulary, his capacity to think and reason is much diminished from what it once was, which also puts him in a sort of downward spiral uh, now, at this point, I think we are actually facing the greatest psychiatric emergency in American history, maybe in world history, uh, because we are now getting cries of alarm from the Republican Party <clears throat> right. and from the White House. <clears throat> so this is no longer a partisan issue. It, it's um, Bob um, uh, Corker, you know, has said that he's unstable. Yes. He's putting us on the path to World War Three. And that with a few exceptions, the majority of his caucus agrees with him. That is saying, that is a whistleblower 
What he is saying is the majority of Republicans believe that he is uh, mentally unfit, disordered, and dangerous. They, they uh, and have people said in the that. White House are saying the same thing. They, that's right. And and what's really interesting is the leaking that is happening is coming from yeah. the people in the White House around him, and uh, cry for help. Yes, and they are they are trying to let the the Republicans in the Senate know. Uh, that this man is unstable, he's unraveling. Bob Corker not only said, mm-hmm. you know, after Charlottesville that he doesn't have the maturity or, uh, you know, but then went on to say after he said fire and fury about North Korea and all this, that, you know, he this 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 man is unraveling, he's unstable, uh, and most everyone knows it. That's what yes. scared me was, you know, Corker didn't yes. stop at, you know, just, yes. uh, you know, uh, I right. think he could cause World War Three, but most everyone knows it, meaning his Republican yes. colleagues know it. And uh, the, the the amount of uh, chicken crap that goes on, you know, with wor- worrying about Steve Bannon primary and all the whole political part of it is is it pales in comparison to the. the, the That's right. I, I can't understand. I mean, listen, I was no fan of George Bush. I didn't think he was a smart. Right. I didn't think he was a smart man. I thought he was right. easily man- manipulated. I think that he was, you know, good at distorting, uh, you know, uh, uh, information. I think Dick Cheney was kind of borderline evil. Uh, and I think mm-hmm. that Don Rumsfeld was kind of a sadist, too, with the torture and all that stuff. Uh, but I never felt that George Bush was anything but being manipulated and kind of on the silly, dumb side. And his brother was probably the smarter of the two. His own mother had said it. But but everybody, nobody reached out to, uh, you know, try and impeach George Bush from the Republican mm-hmm. Party. Right. And now you right. see Susan Collins getting caught on a hot mic. She's saying, mm-hmm. you know, he's crazy. And, uh, mm-hmm. she, you know, I'm afraid of him. I'm worried. Uh, you've got... Yeah. Uh, you know, all these Republicans coming forward saying things about he's imploding, he's unraveling, he's unstable, he's, uh, you know, uh, there's something yeah. wrong. So you started duty to warn, which, as I said, uh, you know, uh, before I brought you on, is a legal term. Yes. And it applies to your profession. Why? Well, it originated with a, a lawsuit where a patient told his therapist he was going to kill his girlfriend. The therapist didn't warn her and he killed her. And at that point, it became the law and part of our ethical code in almost every state, that uh, it's in the ethical code of every state, but it's actually in the law of most states, that if you have reason to believe or suspect that someone that you're treating could be dangerous to someone, you have to warn that person. Now, people who are very concrete and legalists like to point out, no, I'm not treating Donald Trump. Therefore, it's not exactly the same duty. But it is the same principle, and it is multiplied by millions and millions of potential victims. I really want your listeners to write this down, okay? Ted Lieu has introduced a bill, House Resolution 669, which would take away from Donald Trump the capacity to launch a first nuclear strike. It would require Congress to authorize a first nuclear strike. Because Which right I, now I, I'm Donald not, Trump is I, yeah. got a gun to our head. Yeah, and I, I'm not. The world head. I think uh, you know our audience is smarter than the average bear, but I don't know how many people understand because uh, we haven't really you know specifically drilled down on this. But that the president of the United States, all by himself, all Correct. alone, can launch Correct. a nuclear strike. Other than that, it's you not know, that much harder. It's not that much harder than his uh, uh, launching a tweet. It's like that Stephen King no- novel, Dead Zone, you know? I mean, it, it just it's it's just so creepy. But uh, anyway, I don't know that people understand that the president can do that without Congress. I think most people do not understand Right, that. right. And that's one of the reasons that they don't realize how much danger they are truly in. Yeah. So our duty to warn, you know, such as it existed when we began this movement, mm-hmm. uh, you know, now it's time to turn the volume up to 10. Because now the, the, the thing that we're warning about is, I think, actually truly imminent danger, I honestly believe, and I'll explain it, it sounds dramatic, but I will justify it, I honestly believe that he is far more probable to push the button than not, based on his psychopathology, based on the fact that malignant narcissistic leaders always make war with the full power of their armamentarium, and based on the fact that he is a, a cornered animal right now with this Mueller investigation, he's guilty of sin, they're closing in on him and his family, and I'm telling you, this guy's going to shoot his way out, and he's going to try to regain the position of power by being the attacker rather than the, 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 the uh, prosecuted, and he's going to try to distract the country with a, a war, and he's going to you know, wag the dog kind of phenomenon, distract them from his wrongdoing. So this law could make the difference between whether your grandchildren get to have grandchildren. Uh, it's that important. We have to take the gun out of his hand. And that is this, you only need 19 Republicans to vote for it, 
and we can take the gun out of his hands. They know he's unfit. Yeah. They know he's dangerous. They know that the world, life on Earth, hangs in the balance. They know that they should just do the right thing and put that under congressional authority. It's not even an anti-Trump bill. It's not even going to anger his followers. It's just Congress asserting its power against the executive branch and saying, if we have the power to declare war, that means we have the power to declare a first nuclear strike. Right. Right. Now, uh, you know, there are people in your profession who are pushing back, uh, uh, you know, against what you are doing, which is diagnosing, uh, you know, uh, a person that isn't in your office. And, uh, you know, I, I looked at the Goldwater rule to see what it was because I was reading about you. And it turns out that Barry Goldwater was uh, successfully able to sue uh, the American yeah. Psychiatric Association because um, they they tried to diagnose him from afar. And so since 1973, mm -hmm. there's this principle in your profession that says that you don't diagnose somebody from afar. But, you know, Justin Frank used to be on this show all the time when Bush was. Uh, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bush on the couch. We, I we mean, just had, we just had a duty to warn meeting in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah. How and Justin Frank was one of our speakers. Oh, how is he? He's, he's such a he's good... great. Yeah, he's a great man. Uh, so he wrote Bush on the Couch, and, uh, you know, we discussed some of the, you know, complexes mm -hmm. Bush had growing up and the daddy thing and all that. But I know what a narcissist is. Unfortunately, I do. And, uh, you know, uh, your profession had this conference with like a thousand, uh, you know, uh, uh, professionals there who specialize in, you know, this kind of thing. And they were debating it, and they said, oh, well, you know, the reason why we have the Goldwater Rules is because Barry Goldwater was able to successfully sue us so it's more of a a, a, a fear of being sued yeah, and a fear right. of like being, a cover your ass yeah and yeah, a fear of being exactly. punished with reimbursements yeah. to uh, yes. yeah yes you read that in the orker yeah i'm glad I that did. was finally exposed yeah uh and i was uh, glad that john zinner one of our social speakers from washington was the one who exposed it you know everyone thinks they're coming from this high and mighty position mm -hmm. in fact behind closed doors they said we don't want to ent we don't want to uh, antagonize the administration they might reduce our third party reimbursement the APA is a guild organization, yeah. and they protect the guild of psychiatry. They do not protect the American public. And if there is a, a conflict, they will go with the guild every time. They always have. I know. Uh, look at their whole history of relationship with Big Pharma. Uh, it's one sacrificing the public for their uh, corrupt financial interests and that of the industry they're allied with time and time again. So these are not the people from Mount Sinai to tell us what to do. Right. Um, I mean, it's it's one of those doctors things where no doctor has ever done anything, you know, harmful, even though, you know, you do have, uh, you know, uh, prescriptions being written like crazy by, you know, uh, pain management specialists and all that. So, yeah, I get it. When I figured out that it was a guild and I figured out that, you know, you had this meeting uh, and they actually gave voice to the idea that, oh, our reimbursements will suffer or, oh, you know, Barry Goldwater was successful in his lawsuit. Then I suddenly it became very clear why they're pushing back against you. Uh, but there is another guy um, that actually disagrees with you. Uh, he, he, he's probably your biggest critic. He's, he's a guy named Alan. Al Francis. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. he, he wrote the guidelines for diagnosing narcissistic personality disorder, and he rejects the claim. But he says he did. He says he did. Oh, okay. Actually, it's the committee. So I, I have to say this. He's being very narcissistic and even saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to share this with you, okay? Uh, because uh, Dr. Francis uh, alleges that unless Trump doesn't believe a word he's saying, then uh, really, uh, you know, he needs to show that he does believe it and he's completely disconnected from reality. That is not my experience with a world heavyweight champion narcissist with borderline personality disorder who literally imploded upon himself and, uh, you know, had delusions and and, and drove uh, uh, from the Midwest to New York City, believing that they, you know, he had a big, big job that only he could fill. And he was on his way there. And, uh, you know, he actually did do this and then got into a fight with a police officer when he was found sleeping in his car and uh, kicked the police officer who then had him, uh, you know, committed. And he understood that he was in trouble. And he I the thing was. When the person felt his feelings for the first time, he imploded. He just could not deal with all his feelings. So I disagree with him that he has to believe that he's lying. This guy, this guy, I, I'm telling you, and, and the crazy... Well, look, either way, if he, if he believes the crazy things he's saying, then he has a delusional disorder, which means he is psychotic which is now a whole other level of severity. But that was the end, that was that the end stage. Psychotic. That was a very end stage. That, right. I do believe that he is psychotic. Uh, it was, he has what we call transient psychotic symptoms that we see in personality disorders where 
they can bend reality to their fantasies and needs. Uh, and so he had the biggest crowd size. You know, he had to, because he has to be the best. He has to have had the biggest crowd size. So there is a kind of a delusional quality. But if he were just lying, then he would be an antisocial personality disorder. Either way, <laughs> he meets criteria for a severe and serious and dangerous disorder. Yeah, I mean, listen, the the idea that, uh, you know, he, whether we care if he knows he's lying or he's not lying, I, I, it doesn't matter to me. He's the president of the United States. He's got a, a, a really distorted view of the world. But the thing that makes me believe that he truly is a diagnosable sadist slash narcissist slash borderline personality disordered mm-hmm. person is the fact yeah. that he is contagious, meaning everyone mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. him. Now you yeah. have General John Kelly lying for him and... And making himself into a liar on the be- at the behest of you know uh, his boss who is a narcissist that that is exactly the experience that I've seen where narcissists they they, they have like this lane that they're good in they're, they're niched out people and they're very very good at what they do in their lane the second they get out of their lane like like, like for instance Trump uh, was probably very good at licensing his name. Okay, this is what he's good at, and mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. laundering money. You know, perhaps he's he, <laughs> he's very good at it. But well, he's not good. At, he's not. There's a lot of talent to launder money. <laughs> I mean, you know, his whole experience with the banks not lending to him. So where did he get his money? That's another subject right. for a different right. expert. But the idea that he was very good in his niched out lane, that he had 60 employees, and yet when he talks to the media, he says he hired tens of thousands of people. Right there. I mean, it's. It, and then he gets out of his lane, and he's now the president of the United States, and he is managing an awesome government, okay, an intelligence community and a defense community and a, sec- a state department and a Congress and a Senate and a- all these moving parts. And he's clearly out of his lane and clearly over his head, and yet he can get yeah. people who know that to lie for him. That is a very specific thing that... Right. Right. He is so toxic that everyone right. around him essentially is sort of like it's a Midas touch reverse. Like everyone around him, their kind of soul withers. Um, you know, like so like they're like they're having their soul sucked out by a dementor or something yeah. in Harry Potter. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you it's, know? Yes. Yes, it is that. It really is that feeling. And and, and, and and these people are turning themselves into gigantic world heavyweight champion liars. Uh, and, and, and the feeling some have is that John Kelly is doing it because it's his duty to protect us from the bad, bad Donald Trump man. Uh, and yet, if John Kelly and the rest of the cabinet would, uh, you know, get real and uh, stop being infected by him, they would invoke the 25th Amendment. OK, well, they're the ones who actually have the authority to do that. And we have a petition with 65 that we directed towards mental health professionals with 65,000 signatures yeah. that we've sent to every member of the cabinet. Not that that should be their deciding uh, factor, but to make it clear to them that uh, there is professional consensus that this president is truly mentally unfit and dangerous, and that it is their responsibility in seeing that to be the ones to take action under the 25th Amendment. I was actually just meeting with uh, uh, Representative Jamie Raskin earlier this afternoon, uh, Representative Raskin actually spoke at oh, you met him today? in Washington. Uh, yeah, I just came back. In fact, I was I was worried, worried I was going to be late to speak to you because I hit traffic coming back from Washington. <laughs> um, but he's <laughs> but he I was going to have to pull over into like a, a Wendy's or something. <laughs> but he um, <laughs> but he but he's the uh, uh, sponsor of House Resolution 1987, yeah. which is an attempt to operationalize the uh, 25th Amendment. That in the situation that a um, there was a serious question of a president's mental capacity. That there would be a, a bipartisan or nonpartisan commission of psychiatrists, medical doctors, uh, retired politicians from both parties that could really make an objective, uh, consensual assessment of his fitness for office. Yeah, so Jamie Raskin, for those, have- for those of you who don't know, he is a, a Democrat from Maryland, and he, he has a, a resolution, uh, uh, you know, uh, 1987, that's right, and he um, is trying to put up a, a set up a commission of professionals, of, of psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, of, of medical professionals uh, to uh, decide whether or not the president is fit and, uh, you know, invo- mm-hmm. invoke the 25th Amendment. It's a, it's, a, it's a long shot, but it's an effort. So, you know what, I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the trigger for this man? I mean, how how much longer before he, you know, decides to lash out? Yeah. Well, look, I, I really think that people need to understand, and this is my honest professional assessment, that he is a ticking time bomb. 
that we are actually living in real life that that show 24 you know where the uh, you know if we don't if we can't solve the mystery by you know the end of the the, the time period you know it, it, there's some bombs going to go up in times square he is a ticking time bomb i think people really need to understand not only that he has the capacity to launch uh, on his uh, on a whim mm-hmm. um, but he is sick enough to do it and in fact so sick that it is actually the type of thing he would do and he's deteriorating, and he's under stress from an investigation which is essentially fatal to him, his administration, and his family. And I'm telling you, this is a very dangerous combination. And talk about things not ending well. Um, the, the, we really need to take the gun out of his hands. We need to take the nuclear missiles out of his hands. It could be the last thing we ever do if well, we don't I'll, succeed in doing this. I, I will make sure that each and every person who is listening, uh, every single person who is in our chat room, every single person who is listening on a podcast, that they all uh, call their Congress member and they all call Thank their you. senator and that they uh, ask to please, please take the nuclear option away from the president and put it back to, con- uh, you know, well, not back. Thank but you. Give it to Congress. Yes. All right. The book is called uh, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. Uh, You know, one of the authors, John Gartner, uh, also has uh, a group that you can uh, join, that you can uh, watch, that you can, uh, you know, get updates from called Duty to Warn. And of course, they are trying to uh, get a commission set up um, to uh, uh, get Congress to start thinking about invoking the 25th Amendment. Listen, I... I'm so glad you didn't have to do this from a Wendy's. Thank you for taking your time. <laughs> I look forward to talking for to you me. again in the future. Give Justin Frank be my, my be very best. Right. I will. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Can you believe this? Mary, how does it go? The fall. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Roach Show. Turn up your mind. I love golf, but if I were in the White House, I don't think I'd ever see Turnberry again. I don't think I'd ever see Doral again. I own Doral in Miami. I don't think I'd ever see many of the places that I have. I don't ever think I'd see anything. I just want to stay in the White House and work my ass off, make great deals, right? Who's going to leave? There won't be time to go on vacations. There won't be time to go golfing all the time. I'm not going to play much golf because there's a lot of work to be done. You need leadership. Yeah. You know, you can't fly to Hawaii to play golf. I don't know where the president <laughs> was. He wasn't very far away. Maybe he was playing golf. Obama, it was reported today, played 250 rounds of golf. Obama went golfing every day. Let Obama go play golf every day. Obama plays more golf than professional players on the PGA Tour. He played a lot of golf. He's played more than most PGA Touring professionals play. More than a guy who plays on the PGA Tour plays. PGA Tour. Plays more golf. Plays more golf. PGA Tour. PGA Tour. I mean, this guy. Golf, 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 golf. More, more. Learning how to chip, learning how to hit the drive, learning how to putt. Oh, I want more. If you become president and you go to the White House, why would you want to leave the White House? When you're in the White House, who the hell wants to play golf? Who wants to leave the White House? How the hell do you leave for three weeks to play golf? If I get elected president, I'm going to be in the White House a lot. I'm not leaving. I'm going to be working for you. I'm not going to have time to go play golf and believe me. You're a genius. Oh, my God. He doesn't even realize that there is videotape. Uh, He doesn't understand the modern world in which he toils. Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. How are you? How are you? So check this out. Uh, While uh, we were here toiling on Friday, you know, delivering uh, fabulous broadcast materials for you, uh, I had a flood in my house. And it wasn't due to global warming or any weather thing at all. It was just a a pipe that exploded. uh, outside, you know, where the, the the hose spigot is. But apparently there's a crack in my foundation and uh, the water decided to come in into the living room. Isn't that fun? Uh, and Howard was uh, at when I got home from the uh, from the wor- work from the job, 
Uh, you know, Howard didn't come uh, to answer the phone. Scotty was on the phone. doing a fabulous job for us on Friday. Thank you, Scotty. But, uh, you know, Howard was on. He didn't want to tell me because he didn't want to mess up my day. So um, I come home Friday and my, uh, my, my significant other is hunched over a mop. And he's just mopping, mopping, mopping. And the water is still flowing, flowing, flowing. And so by, at 2.30 in the morning, we had uh, plumbers in the house. Uh, the drywall began to crumble. The baseboards were removed from the wall. Uh, you know, some voluntarily, some baseboards had their own idea, like, I'm out of here, and just boom, like off the wall. And uh, our plumber, John, who, by the way, is a conservative, and, uh, you know, invited me to shoot AK-47s uh, with him at 2.30 in the morning. The man worked till 2.30 in the morning, and the last thing he said is, we should go shoot AK-47s. I mean, uh, it's just a, uh, wow, what an experience. But uh, I just want you to know that this is the sacrifice uh, that uh, we make for you, and Donald Trump was golfing. Day 74 is what he was doing. That was the 74th golf trip this president has had in just nine months of uh, being the commander-in-chief. Can you believe that? 74 days of golf in uh, nine months. I mean, this is unbelievable. Puerto Rico, 17% of the island has power. Let me say that again. 17, which is why I don't feel sorry for myself that my house is imploding. Because I looked at the house and I looked at the amount of water we had and I looked at my poor uh, husband hunched over a mop and I said, can you imagine if he was an old Puerto Rican man? Can you? Can you imagine if I was an old Puerto Rican woman? And I went home and saw what they saw. Or even Houston. And it's funny because the water remediation guys who came with the wet vacs and they came with the dehumidifiers and they came with the fans. and all, I have no idea what this is going to cost. I mean, not a clue. Uh, so anyway, the, 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 all these guys that came, they had just come from Houston. They had just spent a month in Houston. So I refuse to feel sorry for myself. But if you want to support the show today, that would be a really nice thing to do. Just saying. Just saying. And then, of course, we had some issues over the weekend uh, with the website. Now, you know, just a normal day for me. Meanwhile, a normal day for Trump is golfing. Day 74. And he is golfing. Golfing. But he does take time out to tweet. You know, I got to tell you, he is not all he has to do with this case. Of, you know, I, I don't know if you saw David Johnson's funeral, but, you know, it's a local story for us because this is our hood. This is our a place okay we know this congresswoman okay yes she's flamboyant but she was a a, a, a principal of the school that uh david johnson's dad went to she knows this family for decades she is the closest person uh to this family uh, you know beside the family members you know she's been in these kids lives since they were in grade school I mean, and of course, so uh, Myesha Johnson uh, decided to do one interview this weekend. She, uh, after the funeral, okay? And so she did one interview over the weekend, after which Donald Trump tweeted at her and called her a liar. So Saturday, we were able to watch the funeral. I mean, it was the saddest thing to see this young, Myesha Johnson is 24 years old, 24 years old. Her husband, Le David was 25 years old. I mean, these are kids. These are kids. And he'd already made Buck Sergeant, okay? He was already an E, what is he, an E4. He was already an E4. This guy's 25 years old. That's amazing. That means he really worked hard. It means he did what it takes most people five years to do in just three years. Now, what's really creepy is no one knew these guys were there. I'll play you the clips from the Sunday shows. Uh, no one knew. The Republican Party didn't know. The Democratic Party didn't know. Lindsey Graham didn't know. Chuck Schumer didn't know. Uh, the people who are in the Gang of Eight who are supposed to be briefed up on every military operation, those are them. They did not know that we had 1,000 soldiers stationed in Niger. Uh, something really sneaky and gross is going on. I don't know what it is. I, I really, honest to God, don't know why they're not being regularly briefed, but they haven't been briefed. But I just want to play you a little clip of Myesha Johnson uh, saying her, her, her story, what happened on that phone call. And then Trump tweets at her. And all he has to do is apologize and say, I'm sorry if what I said wasn't comforting. I really did mean to comfort you. That's why I called. 
this whole thing has spiraled out of control. It, I didn't mean for it. When I sent Kelly out, that was another double down on your calling you and the congresswoman a lot. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm calling you now to, uh, you know, invite you or to comfort you or to just say I'm so sorry if it came across the... That's all he has to do. But, oh, no, he doubles down. The woman actually comes... First of all, he tweeted at uh, Congressman Federica Wilson again uh, on Saturday, and she, he called her the wacky Congressman Federica Wilson, um, and he said she was killing the Democratic Party, and when he tweeted to her, she was in the funeral procession. She was in the car going to David's funeral. And he tweets that she's the problem and that there's something wrong with her. She's wacky and she shouldn't. Uh, she's killing the Democratic Party. This man, he, it's, it, it, he's just, I mean, obviously, I started with the golf thing just to show you he's such a freaking liar. But all right, here, here is Maisha Johnson, okay? What have they told you about what happened in Africa? I really don't no answers to that one neither because when they came to my house they just told me that um it was a massive gunfire and my husband as of october 4th was missing they didn't know his whereabouts they didn't know where he was or where to find him and a couple of days later is when they told me that he went from missing to killed in action i don't know how he got killed where he got killed or anything. I don't know that part. They never told me and that's what I've been trying to find out since day one, since October 4th. Are you confident you're gonna get the answers you need? If I keep pushing for them, I will. And they just say they don't know? They won't tell me. They, they won't tell me anything. I, I don't know anything. Oh, my God, that is what this woman has been wrestling with since the 4th of October, okay? The 4th of October, somebody comes to her house and says, your husband is missing in action. We don't know where he is. We don't know how to find him. A couple days later, 48 hours later, they find this man's body, and they find him a mile away from where the ambush is, and she wants to know what happened, and they don't tell her anything. This is what she's been dealing with. What is today? October, what, 23rd? October 23rd, she doesn't know what happened to her husband. Do you think the president gives a rat's ass that this is what she's been dealing with? Uh, no, because this is what uh, this is what happened. There are also a lot of questions about the phone call you received from President Trump. I know you were in a car to the airport. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened next. Me and my family was in the limo to receive my husband from, I think that was... Denver, Dover, we went to? Dover. Dover. And we was literally on the airport strip getting ready to get out. And he called Master Sergeant Neil phone. I asked Master Sergeant Neil to put his phone on speaker so my aunt and uncle could hear as well. And he goes on to saying his statement as what he said was the president yes the president said that he knew what he signed up for but it hurts anyways and i was it made me cry because i was very angry at the the tone of his voice and how he said it like he he, he couldn't remember my husband's name the only way he remembered my husband's name because he told me he had my husband report in front of him and that's when he actually said la david I heard him stumbling on trying to remember my husband's name. And that was hurting me the most because if my husband is out here fighting for our country and he risked his life for our country, why can't you remember his name? And that would make me upset and cry even more because my husband was an awesome soldier. He did what it take people, other soldiers, like five years to do in three years. So imagine if my husband was here now. He, my, it took my husband three years to make E5. It take other soldiers five to six years just to make an E5. So if he was here now, he would have been on his way to being an E6 or an E7. My husband had high hopes in, in the military career. What did you say to the president? I, I, didn't, I didn't say anything. I just listened. 
but you were upset when you got off the phone. Oh, very, very upset and hurt. Very. It made me cry even worse. She didn't say anything to the president. And then as soon as she was off the TV on Sunday, okay, Saturday, she buries her husband. Uh, she doesn't know what happened to him. She hasn't seen his body also. Uh, that's another thing. And, and she talks about that. That is crushing. I'll play you that. But uh, so she says nothing. The master sergeant in the car, who's part of the, uh, um, uh, you know, the, I guess what they call them, what do they call them? The condolence, uh, well, it's not the condolence crew, but you know what I mean. There's a, a, a contingency of soldiers, uh, you know, that uh, notify the family of the death and they attend the funeral and they fold the flag and they do the military honors. And so they were with her, okay? And um, uh, they, the master sergeant got the phone call from the president and she said put him on speakerphone so my aunt and uncle can hear and of course uh, congressman wilson is in the car because she's a family friend and they probably called her because they didn't know what to do and she said i'll be there i'll be there okay what's really disgusting though is she says nothing to the president and then she goes on uh sunday she did one interview she did not trash the president in fact uh, george stephanopoulos asked her if she has anything to say to the president and she said no i'd like to say nothing she doesn't want to criticize him at all but um right after this sunday appearance trump tweets at her and he attacks her i mean this is unbelievable he he who could hear this, the words of a bereaved widow, a young 24-year-old widow, who is pregnant with her third daughter? We know, you know, she said that she's having a little girl, and she's, uh, you know, due in three months. She's six months pregnant. She also has a six-year-old and a, uh, a, a, I think, a, a two-year-old. Uh, who could look at this and say, I have to hit her back hard? He tweets at her, quote, I had a very respectful conversation with the widow of Sergeant Le David Johnson and spoke his name from the beginning without hesitation. I mean, why does he do things like that? She's sitting there on television, you know, saying, I have nothing bad to say, but, and then she explains that Frederica Wilson is an old family friend, and I don't know why he's attacking her. Congresswoman Wilson reported that, and you, you explained she, she was in the car with you. Yes. She's been close to your family for a long time. Yes, yes. Ms. Wilson, she, my uncle-in-law was Ms. Wilson's elementary school um, principal and my husband was in her 5,000 role model program that's why she's well connected with us because she had been in our family since we were since we were little kids the president said that the congresswoman was lying about the phone call whatever miss Wilson said was not fabricated what she said was a hundred percent correct it was Master Sergeant Neal, me, my aunt, my uncle, and the driver, and Ms. Wilson in a car. The phone was on speaker phone. Why would we fabricate something like that? Is there anything you'd like to say to the president now? No. I don't, nah, I don't have nothing to say to him. And then he tweets at her. And then he tweets at her. He shouldn't, not only shouldn't he be in charge of making these phone calls, but more importantly, he shouldn't be in charge of the military, okay? This man should not be the commander in chief. He should not be in charge of the policies that lead to the deaths that make these calls necessary. This is unbelievable to me. He is disgraceful. This woman was literally burying her husband on Saturday and in the funeral procession was the congresswoman from the district who knows this family for decades and he's tweeting at Congressman Frederica Wilson calling her wacky, disputing her story. And then she goes and gives one interview. One interview doesn't trash the president in any way, just explains what happened to her husband that she wishes she knew. She doesn't have anything to say to the president, but what Frederica Wilson said is true. And the president then tweets at the widow. For a commercial free, on demand, whenever, wherever listening experience, visit randyrhodes.com for your personal premium podcast today. Yeah, you could buy tile at a 
chain store if you wanted to. You could wait for a kid to try and answer your questions about what's this made of or how do I install it or what's in stock. But what if you wanted serious craftsmanship? What if you wanted custom design, handmade, to order from your imagination or an inspiration photo that you love? Probably you think you can't anymore, but I did. When it was time to shop tile, I came across a family-owned business that still handcrafts each and every individual tile, matching your colors, your inspiration, your design. Tempest Tile Works. They're based in Portland, Oregon, and they still handcraft the most magnificent tile. Let them match to your fabrics or to your countertops or to anything you can envision for your bath or kitchen. Teeny tiny tiles to oversized their art or yours. It's all doable, it's all affordable, and it's all individually made just for your project. Visit Tempest Tile Works and look at their amazing gallery of designs and styles and give up the chain stores. Tempest Tile Works, custom made. TempestTileWorks.com. This is the voice of the resistance. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network. Dear fellow progressive, these are the times that try men's souls. It is not the first time our country has been in peril and it won't be the last. It is, however, a unique threat from within, one the precise likes of which we have never seen before. It is our modern media mix that has enabled an incurious, unserious, pathological liar and textbook narcissist to accede to the highest office in the land. His is a world of make-believe, one that could only have been concocted by a student of reality TV. At least we know he studied something. The imagined slights, the trumped up, pun intended, feuds, the insulting nicknames, the Twitter diarrhea, it is all of a piece. Entertaining, funny even, in another context, but when you're busy blowing up the country's longest running foreign relationships, devastating the environment, threatening trade wars, and embracing all the wrong actors, it's really hard to find the humor. At Progressive Voices, we take holding the powerful accountable is our most serious mission, and there is nothing more important to us today than making sure the PV audience is informed with unbiased information and that more and more people become part of our audience, and therefore are better informed than they can be by relying solely on the mainstream media, which, in so many ways, has shrunk from its duty as the watchdog of democracy. It is our sincere hope that you will help us in this important mission at this most critical hour. Go to ProgressiveVoices.com and make your donation today. Please give whatever you can. Remember, we are a tax-exempt 501c3, meaning that your donations are fully tax-deductible. Thanks for supporting the Progressive Voices Network. Hi, it's Randy Rhodes. Listen to me on the PV live stream or on demand or both on the PV app. Just go to ProgressiveVoices.com or download the Progressive Voices app. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. The President of the United States he is still focusing on you. He was tweeting about you this morning, uh, even, and there his, his, uh, his tweet, wacky, Congressman Wilson is the gift that keeps on giving, et cetera, et cetera, disaster for Dems. Um, what do you make of the fact that the President is so focused on you and has not tweeted about Sergeant Johnson? Well, that's, that's the way he is. And I, I'm sick of him giving people nicknames. He doesn't want me to give him a nickname. But today, I want to set the record straight. And I want people to understand what is actually happening in Africa and try to connect the dots. Because I think this is going to be this administration's Benghazi. This is going to be Trump's Benghazi, Trump's Niger. And they need to concentrate on what happening, what happened, and what is happening. Uh, Representative Hastings and I wrote a letter to General Mattis about this investigation. We have not heard anything, but I want to go way back to when I started with this. Bring back our girls every Wednesday. And this was all about watching what Boko Haram was doing in Nigeria. So there was a multinational task force that was put together that included Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, Benin, and Chad. 
So this, they were put in place to fight Boko Haram. Boko Haram broke in half, one half went with ISIS. That's the group that's in Niger. The other half is still in Nigeria, in the Nigerian area. So as I'm advocating for Bring Back Our Girls and advocating against Boko Haram and going to Africa and making sure that the, the Congress watches this and we're red, wearing red every Wednesday, unbeknownst to me, I have a soldier who is personal to me, who was a member of my 5,000 Role Models of Excellence project in that region fighting or advising troops against Boko Haram. All of this is going on and I do not know. So here I am in America advocating against Boko Haram, fighting for the release of the little girls who they kidnapped from their boarding school, 274 of them, going back to Nigeria to visit them, to let them know that the Congress of the United States has not forgotten them. And all of this fighting is going on in that region of Africa, and I don't think we've done enough. In the meantime, I get a call that the David was killed in Niger, fighting Boko Haram. How coincidental can this be? So this is very personal to me. It's very personal to me, and it's amazing how these two things lock together. Yeah. Uh, so I told you, uh, the Congressman Federico Wilson it has had as one of her main issues Boko Haram and those girls that were kidnapped. And every Wednesday, every Wednesday for, for a very long time, more than a year, uh, they would wear red and go out on the street and hold up these uh, signs, bring back our girls. And she didn't know that one of the 5,000 uh, role models of excellence, a mentoring group that she started, I think she started in 1993 when she was still a high school principal, okay, for the boys in her school who indicated that they were interested in public service, whether it was to become police officers, firefighters, or join the military, she started this mentorship program and she calls La David Johnson La David because this boy is known to the family. I told you this. And so she doesn't know that she's got one of her uh, 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 kids who are in her 5,000 um, Role Models of Excellence mentorship program. She doesn't even know where he's been sent. She is a member of Congress and nobody told her that uh, they had uh, uh, sent Le David to uh, Niger, where she had previously been. She had gone to Africa uh, to assure the people of Nigeria that, they, that the U.S. Congress was involved in trying to get their kidnapped girls back. She had actually made a trip to Africa uh, to talk to the parents of the kidnapped girls who were kidnapped by Boko Haram. And she knows that Boko Haram has split into two, and she knows that uh, half of the, the group Boko Haram has joined ISIS, and, half, and that's the group that's in Niger. She knows this. Trump doesn't know this. Because right before all this happened, Trump was saying to a, a radio host, Chris Plant, that because he's the president, there is no more ISIS. So part of his reason for trashing these two, uh, the, these people, a widow and her congresswoman who mentored uh, these children, uh, who are still children, basically, they're 24 and 25 years old, uh, is, it, it, it just, it, it. so here, here is uh, the rest of the Sunday shows where Lindsey Graham has asked, did you know, did you know that we had a thousand troops in Niger? Did you know? All right, before I let you go, you've come on this show numerous <laughs> times and said Russia needs to be punished. You passed a tough sanctions bill. You passed it in July. The president signed it in early August. Right. Um, there was a deadline of October 1st. It is not October 1st. It is October 20th, and the sanctions have not been implemented. Why? Okay, so this is a different, this is a different portion of the same question. Uh, well, it's a different question. But he, so just so you know, the president of the United States... Is, was supposed to renew the sanctions on Russia 
the Magnitsky Act sanctions on Russia on October 1st, and today is the 23rd. That has not happened. The president has not uh, authorized the uh, sanctions on Russia. So Lindsey Graham was asked, uh, why, why hasn't the president done that? Why? Uh, I think uh, the, the Trump administration is slow when it comes to Russia. They have a blind spot on Russia I still can't figure out. But I can tell you what happened in 16. Can you? Is that become, at what point well, is that circumstantial evidence to you, sir? All I can say is that wherever the Russia investigation takes us, mm -hmm. it will take us. In 16, they interfered in our elections to the, I don't think they affected the outcome, but in 18 and 20, they're coming back against us. What are the rules of engagement? Did what they do in 2016, did that amount to an act of war? How do you respond to cyber threats? We're, we're really not well together as a nation in terms of the threats we're facing from the cyber arena. Right. But Russia's gonna get worse, if not better. Mr. And, Mr. President, go after Russia, cause they're coming right, after us. But how are you gonna hold him accountable if he doesn't implement these sanctions? Uh, the Congress will have a way to hold the president accountable. I think he's beginning to understand the threats we face better and better each day. All right. So oh, that's the wrong clip. It, it's my fault. Um, here, here's uh, Lindsey Graham. We had no idea we had a thousand people in Russia. Are we uh, going to need a new war authorization? You're, it sounds like you're arguing so. no, but by the way, you're going to be in the minority, aren't you? Uh, I don't know. I'm arguing that the current authorization, as long as it's related to radical Islam, is enough. But here's the military determines who the threats are. Right. They come up with the engagement policy. And if we don't like what the military does, we can defund the operation. But I didn't know there was a thousand troops in Niger. John McCain is right to tell the military because this is an endless war without boundaries, no limitation on time and geography. You've got to tell us more. And he's right to say that. All right. Before I let you go, you've come on. Uh, he didn't know we had a thousand uh, uh, troops in Niger. He didn't know. And then Chuck Schumer came on and they asked Chuck Schumer, did you know we had a thousand troops in Niger? Taking place in, uh, in Africa. What does this mean for the war authorization? You heard Senator Graham there. He didn't know we had a thousand troops in Niger. Did you? Uh, no, I did not. Um, and what it means, uh, Chuck, for the war authorization is I agreed with Senator Paul that we ought to look at this carefully. We are in a brave new world, you know, there are uh, no set battle plans, you don't declare war and then fight three weeks later. But having said that, the Constitution says Congress has the power to declare war, and if you're in a long-term war, Congress ought to keep that ability. So we need to re-examine this. We're on a AUMF that extends uh, 16 years from right after uh, we were attacked. Uh, at the World Trade Center. So I would be for re-examining it. Absolutely. There's no easy answer, but we should look at it. The answer we have now is not adequate. No one knew these guys were there. Congress doesn't know. The Gang of Eight, the Armed Services Committee, the, the, the people uh, who, who, who are supposed to be overseeing uh, the military operations in Congress, they don't know. And we don't have a new authorization to use, mil that's an AUMF, an authorization to use military force. We don't have one and we're, we're deploying to Africa. And Lindsey Graham is like, well, it's a war without end and we just go and it's okay. And no, I didn't know they were there. I had no idea. And Chuck Schumer said that, you know, yes, we do need a new authorization to use military force if the war is morphing, as Lindsey Graham says. Uh, you know, Congress has the, the only uh, ability to declare war, except the president can launch nuclear on uh, the first nuclear strike that's that's a different issue uh, it's going to be the same with this guy but uh, to to put troops in africa a separate continent first of all when we were hit on 9 11 just in case you're too young to remember 9 11 15 of the 19 hijackers were from saudi arabia no one on those planes was from iraq not one single hijacker was from iraq or afghanistan okay so we attack Afghanistan, then that morphs into an attack in Iraq, which had nothing to do with the Saudi attackers who attacked us on 9-11-2001. All of a sudden now we're on a new continent, we're in Africa, a completely separate continent, and we have new, a new deployment to fight uh, an offshoot of ISIS, which was created when we attacked Iraq. Iran won the Iraq you know, we attacked Iraq, and who was the winner of that war? Iran. 
So now they're done with that. So now we want to go into a different continent with no new authorization to use military force by Congress. And no one, no, Lindsey Graham doesn't know we have a thousand soldiers. Uh, Chuck Schumer doesn't know we have a thousand. Frederica Wilson didn't know that a kid who she was so close to had been deployed to the very countries, the very area that was one of her primary interests as a member of Congress. And Trump is attacking her, and Trump is attacking this widow, and God knows the reason why he feels he has to hit back on a widow, the reason why he feels he has to hit back on a congressman, is because the day before he was on Chris Plant's show declaring victory over ISIS, and obviously ISIS is in Africa, ISIS has become, uh, Boko Haram has become ISIS, and he doesn't want to admit that, uh, you know, as ISIS, and this is what I've told you, when they lose their caliphate, meaning their territory, they go home to Europe, or they go home to Libya, or they go home to other African nations, and they look for associations of other people there, like the militia does here. They look for like, like-minded like individuals. And they don't want... He doesn't want to have to ask Congress about this other continent, so he hasn't told Congress that we're on this other continent. I, it's just, it, and so his way of, of dealing with it is to send out General John Kelly, who has just debased himself. General Kelly lied so much during that uh, press conference that he gave at the press briefing room that it's just so sad. He, he's gone down with Trump. But that this is why he's attacking the widow. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes Air Force. Air, Air, Air Force. RandyRhodes.com. Hey, I need to tell you something about Herky Jerky because over the past year, you've been asking me to ask Jason from Herky Jerky if they will ever produce a, a turkey jerky. Well, I'm proud to tell you that he says absolutely yes. And not only does he have it now, it's absolutely spectacular. Let me start with the taste. It is extremely soft and slightly sweet, and it's bite-sized pieces that taste just like the homemade oven-roasted turkey that you have on Thanksgiving. It's made from turkeys raised without added hormones and just the right amount of salt, natural smoke flavoring, and spices that will make your taste buds go wild. And you asked for healthy. Well, Herky Jerky Turkey Jerky has no nitrates, preservatives, MSG, or artificial ingredients, absolutely zero fat, and packs a whopping 11 grams of protein per serving, and very low in cholesterol. Quite simply, I think this is one of the healthiest and best-tasting high-protein snacks you can get. Herky Jerky is so excited to announce the new Turkey Jerky that they're offering $5 off all packs for the entire month of October. Just use promo code TURKEY when checking out. And as always, they don't sell the little dinky bags that you get at the gas station. They're 14 ounce zip sealed packs and they're meant to last. Herky Jerky, making quality jerky and meat snacks for almost 25 years. Gotta tell you, I believe this is as good as anything I've ever tasted and the best thing they've ever produced. Try some today. HerkyJerky.com This is Ezra Levin, Executive Director of Indivisible. Please go to IndivisibleGuide.com Type in your zip code Find your local Indivisible group and join the movement to resist Trump's agenda. We've teamed up with Progressive Voices Network to help your community take action and hold Congress accountable. Who is this document by and for? We are former Progressive Congressional staffers who saw the Tea Party beat back President Obama's agenda. We see the enthusiasm to fight the Trump agenda and want to share insider info on how best to influence Congress to do that. You want to do your part to beat back the Trump agenda and understand that will require more than calls and petitions. You should use this guide, share it, amend it, make it your own, and get to work. Donald Trump is the biggest popular vote loser in history to ever call himself president-elect. In spite of the fact that he has no mandate, he will attempt to use his congressional majority to reshape America in his own racist, authoritarian, and corrupt image. If progressives are going to stop this, we must stand indivisibly opposed to Trump and the members of Congress, or MOCs, who would do his bidding. Together, we have the power to resist. 
and we have the power to win. Take action and hold Congress accountable. This is Ezra Levin on the Progressive Voices Network asking you to join the millions who decided to become part of the movement to resist Trump's agenda. Check out indivisibleguide.com to start resisting on your home turf. Keep listening for more ways you can get involved. This is the voice of the resistance. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network. The Randy Rhodes Show is live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Do you think he's a role model to children in the United States? No. You don't? No, absolutely not. Uh, I think that, you know, the things that are happening right now that are that are harmful to our nation, um, whether it's the breaking down of we're going to be doing some hearings on some of the things that he purposely is breaking down relationships we have around the world that have been useful to our nation. But I think at the end of the day, when his term is over, I think the debasing the of our nation, um, oh my God. the constant non-truth telling, the, <laughs> just the, the name calling, the things like, I think the debasement the of our nation will be what he'll be remembered most for, and, and that's regretful. Um, um, and it affects young people. I mean, we have young people who, for the first time, are, you know, watching a president uh, stating, uh, you know, absolute non-truths, uh, non-stop, um, personalizing things in the way that he does, and and it's uh, it's it's very sad for our nation. Oh my God, Bob Corker got uncorked this morning. And uh, went out there, went out front and center and said the president is debasing the country. The president is uh, putting the country under threat. Uh, the president is a liar, So, except uh, Corker says he doesn't use the L word. So he just said demonstrably untrue and that everybody up here knows uh, that what he says is untrue because it's easily uh, fact checked. It's, eas- it's easily known by us. I, I, th- that's how this morning started. And uh, then, of course, I don't know if you know, but the president was, uh, well, he went to Capitol Hill today to discuss his uh, tax breaks for the very wealthy. And everybody, after Bob Corker started the day off calling the president, uh, you know, uh, dangerous, uh, a liar, uh, somebody who debases this nation, somebody who is risking our standing in the world and our security in the world. I mean, I don't think Republicans say these things lightly. But after he said all that, uh, and he did say all that, uh, let let me just uh, play you the first clip that uh, this is what happened this morning. Manu Raju was um, following Bob Corker this morning in the hallway in the Senate, and uh, they were going to go to uh, this room. I've been in this room, actually, for a meeting with the senators, and uh, they were going to this room in the Senate right off the floor, and they uh, knew that the president was coming up to Capitol Hill Uh, And they were very, very upset because they're trying to pay for tax cuts for the wealthy. Do not think that the Republicans are your friends. They're not your friends. What their goal here was, was they were trying to uh, reduce taxes for the uber wealthy. They want a $500 billion tax cut cut for corporations. Uh, Some of them don't want to add to the deficit. And this tax plan, as it stands, adds $1.5 trillion to the deficit. So they were looking at middle class tax cuts and they were looking to take them away from us. Okay. Remember, I told you yesterday that they had gone after our 401k contributions. That's 50 million middle class Americans that put money in their 401ks, including me. And so what we're allowed to put away currently is $18,000 a year pre-tax, meaning that money comes right out of your paycheck. The remainder of your paycheck is taxed, but the amount that you're contributing to your retirement is not. So you could put up to $18,000 a year away. Well, if you're over 50, they say, okay, time to really save hard. You could put $24,000 pre-tax in your 401k. The Republicans were looking to take that number down that we could put into our retirement pre-tax down to $2,400. It's insane. But that would have saved them $119 billion, and they're looking to cobble together $1.5 trillion. They've got this $4 trillion tax cut that they're jamming into this $1.5 trillion package. And then they need to write off the $1.5 trillion. So they're going after your local and state tax deduction, your mortgage deduction, your charitable deduction, the pre-tax money that you can set aside for yourself 
in your 401k. And of course, they want to get rid of your subsidies on Obamacare because, you know, that's money, too. Uh, they want to cut Medicaid. They want to cut Medicare by four hundred and seventy billion dollars all to pay for this tax cut. So they're not your friends. OK, Trump tweets out. That. Your 401k won't be touched that that we won't do that. We won't do that. And the Republicans lose their minds because they're trying to keep this on the QT. They're trying to keep this quiet so that they can just ram through these tax cuts and uh, the very wealthy, uh, you know, the the Koch brothers, the Mercer family. I mean, these families would get $50 billion worth of tax relief just in the estate tax repeal. So you're talking about a handful of families would get 30 to $50 billion in tax cuts. This is pissing off the Republicans that Trump is tweeting, no, 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 we won't do that to 50 million Americans. We won't take away their ability to save in their 401k. And the Republicans are losing their minds, okay, because they want these tax cuts because they know that if they don't get these tax cuts through after their failure on Obamacare because they didn't want to take away, uh, you know, uh, the health care from 20 million Americans, which is what the CBO said their plan would do, so they said, OK, we can't do that. We'll be killed in 2018. So now they want these tax cuts because they know if they fail, they'll be killed in 2018. It's all about politics for them. So Bob Corker goes ahead today and comes uncorked and starts, uh, you know, uh, trashing the president because the president is tweeting things and uh, just proceeds to uh, you know, lay out the case against the president and his unbelievable amount of flip flopping, lying. Uh, his word means nothing. Uh, we can't work with him. Uh, you know, he's proved himself to be unable to rise to the occasion of being president, et cetera, et cetera. Check this Nothing out. Nothing that he said in his tweets today uh, were truthful. I know I read it. He knows it. And people around him know it. I, I would hope the staff over there would figure out ways of controlling him when they know that everything he said today was absolutely untrue. I mean, so. you said he's an untruthful president. Are you calling him? No the No question. Yeah, no question. I mean, I don't. We grew up in our family not using the L word, okay. Uh, and but yeah, just uh, I mean, they're provable untruths. Provable. Um, so I mean, on the Iran deal, everybody knows the role I played there, and they're working with me, interestingly, right now um, on uh, on tax reform. I made the deal with Toomey that. You know, has allowed that to go forward. Um, obviously, I want to make sure it's done properly. But and, and then everything else. I mean, four times he encouraged me to run and told me he would endorse me. So I, I don't know. It's it's amazing. Unfortunately, I think world leaders are very aware that um, much of what he says is untrue. Uh, certainly, people here are because these things are provably untrue. I mean, just they're just. Mm factually incorrect and people know the difference so I don't know why he lowers himself uh, to such a low low standard and debases our country in the way that he does but he does and uh, you know look I don't like responding I, I you know you can let him go unanswered but uh, uh, and it's just not me to we don't do tweets like that we've responded twice to again untruths but uh, you know, it's unfortunate that our nation finds itself um, in this place. Is the president of the United States a liar? The president uh, has great difficulty with the truth on many issues. Do you regret supporting him in the election? Uh, well, let's just put it this way. I would not do that again. So. You wouldn't support him no, again? No way. Uh -huh. no. Wow. No, I, I think that uh, he's proven himself... Uh, unable to rise to the occasion i think many of us me and me included have you know tried to you know i've intervened i've had private dinner I've, you know i've been with him on multiple occasions to try to you know, create some kind of aspirational uh, uh, approach if you will to the way that he conducts himself but uh, i don't think that that's possible and um, I, he's obviously not going to to rise to the occasion as president Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's how the morning started, okay? That was early this morning. That, uh, Bob Corker was walking through the Senate office buildings. And, of course, Donald Trump was scheduled and did go. Uh, they had a lunch meeting scheduled on Capitol Hill to discuss the tax breaks. And um, 
Everybody uh, was, I mean, the media just fanned out. They were covering, uh, you know, his arrival to Capitol Hill and say, oh, my God. Uh, one of the, se- Senator Tillerson, uh, or Tillerson, what's his name? Uh, he went and got some popcorn because he wanted to watch the fight between Corker and McCain and Ben Sass, who has questioned uh, Donald Trump's uh, devotion to the Constitution, especially the First Amendment. After all, the NFL tweeting went on. Uh, you had, uh, uh, you know, uh, Senator Mark Kirk from Illinois. Uh, Trump called him a loser and they went at each other. And of course, you've got the legendary fight between John McCain. You had Susan Collins on a hot mic the other day saying that she thinks the president is unstable. She's frightened for the country. She doesn't think that he's uh, stable enough to be the president. So you had all this. But then Bob Corker actually decided ahead of this lunch he would fan out and go to every single news outlet he went to uh, good morning america he i think he did everything but the view i mean he did every damn show uh that there is this morning uh to talk about how the president is lying about the tax cuts he went to george stephanopoulos he would take any reform of 401ks off the table are you confident he's got the will and the skill and the commitment to get this done uh, George, I, I haven't seen that yet. There's about four trillion dollars in loophole closings, uh, credits, uh, all kinds of things that you're very familiar with in the tax code that have to be closed in order to do what has been laid out. And so there's, you know, it's easy to talk about cutting people's rates and doing this, that the things that benefit people, but the spinach, if you will, is in doing all of these reforms, which make filling out your taxes much more simple, and which is what the American people have asked for for years. But if you start taking things off the table, Before you get started, you make that very difficult. And so what I hope is going to happen is the president will leave this effort, if you will, to the tax writing committees, let them do their work and not begin taking things off the table that ought to be debated in these committees um, at the proper time. You see, I tell you, the thing with the 401ks is that the Senate is trying to undermine the middle class as best as they can in order to give these tax cuts to the rich. And so uh, Trump keeps taking things off the table because he realizes it makes him look like, uh, you know, uh, uh, who he is, you know, a guy trying to give tax breaks to the wealthy. And so he's tweeting, uh, you know, up the storm going, no, no, we're not going to do this. And no, no, we're not going to take away your state and local tax. Reduction. No, we're not going to take away your mortgage deduction. No, we're not going to take away your charitable deduction. And then yesterday, uh, you know, I tried to explain to you very quickly that it came out that they were going to take away our 401k contributions or at least lower them down to only 2400 a year we could set aside instead of the 18000 which is the greatest middle class tax break uh, for retirement that ever was devised. And they're going to throw us into these IRAs, uh, you know, Roth IRAs. And those uh, you have to pay taxes on the money and then you could put them in the IRA. So anyway, this is what got uh, Bob Corker all upset. But man, did he trash the president. Uh, He just called him every name he could. The fitness of the president. What are your concerns about this president? Well, look, I this is uh, I've gotten to know the president in a very unique way over the course of the last year. And uh, I guess like all Americans, I would have hoped that he would rise to the occasion and bring out the best in our nation. Charlie, uh, Hopefully what presidents do is to try to bring the country together, to unify around common goals and, uh, and not to debase our country, if you will. And that has not happened, and I'm beginning to believe that it's not going to happen. And I think that's what uh, President Bush, President Obama, many others have been concerned about, as it, it appears to be the governing model of this White House to purposely divide. I mean, that's what happened after the Virginia incident. Mm. Uh, it's to consolidate base, not to bring people together and to bring out the better angels of those people in our country. This is a great nation, and without us doing that, it really not only affects us and future generations, but it affects the world. And so I hope I don't really hold out a lot of hope, but I hope that somehow uh, a little bit different course of action can be taken. Looks like Bob Corker has had enough of this president's lying only because it's getting in the way of them redistributing the wealth back to, well, from us to the very wealthy Americans, which is what the Republican Party is there for. So while what Bob Corker says about the president is demonstrably true, he is unfit, he is unstable, he is not a suitable role model for children, he lies. 
He doesn't take uh, the blame for anything. He has no tax plan. He has none. And that's, this is what's frustrating them, really. They have had enough. Now, the tape about grabbing women and, you know, blah, that wasn't enough for them. Calling Mexican rapists, that wasn't enough for them. The lying that he did on the campaign trail, the calling of Hillary Clinton, you know, to be locked up, that wasn't enough. hiring Flynn as national security advisor when he was really a Russian agent. That was. Now they've had enough. It's the taxes. <laughs> Go to RandyRoads.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast.